taking last set of multiple choice questions. Let's see what we've got here. An SRS of 100 postal employees found that the average, I'm gonna keep that word in mind, average time these employees had worked at the postal service was seven years with a standard deviation of two years. All right, so before I even read any more, I see some units with these numbers, right? I see average, I know I'm gonna be in mean land. All right, do these data provide convincing evidence? They're gonna want me to run a hypothesis test. All right, do these data provide convincing evidence that the mean time of employment, mu, for the population of postal employees has changed from the value of 7.5 years that was true 20 years ago? To determine this, right, we'll, we'll test the hypotheses. H naught average was seven and a half against that it's different from seven and a half in the alternate using a one sample t-test. What conclusion should we draw at the 5% alpha level? Okay, so I'm in mean land. All right, it looks like I'm gonna be using a t-test, right? It says one sample t-test here, okay. Um, I only have the one sample. They only ran this information or this experiment once, or I should say this survey, and it looks like I had 100 postal employees. So if I have 100 postal employees, that's also giving me my degrees of freedom. So I know N is 100, so just anecdotally, my degrees of freedom are 99. If I wanted to do this the long way, when I say long way, I mean I could go get the test statistic, I could run TCDF, I could do all of that stuff if I wanted to, but in all honesty, I don't want to. I want us to get in the habit of using technology to help us go through these problems faster. So let me go ahead and do that. I just need to figure out if there's evidence one way or the other. All right, so let's let's see if I'm gonna reject or fail to reject. So let me clear this out. I'm gonna go over to my tests. Now, I'm not in proportion land, I'm in mean land. So I'm definitely not gonna use five or six. It's these first four that have to do with mean land. But specifically three and four, those are when we have two samples at a time. We're not gonna experience that till we get to chapter 10. So I get to decide between one and two, and I was actually directed to use a t-test here. And again, some stats folks will say, well, since you had at least 30 employees, you might as well use the z-test. I, I just, I don't buy that. So we're gonna go t-test. I don't have raw data. I was not given 100 data values. I have the summary statistics. So it looks like my null mean was 7.5. It looks like my sample mean, right, from these 100 folks, right, here's my statistic. Actually, let me go ahead and write that for you. Here was my statistic, right, and this was, of course, the parameter. Parameter's always in the null. Okay, so my statistic was 7. It looks like my sample standard deviation, S, was 2. Um, I did not have 5644. Uh, that was from the last problem when we, when we were doing the IV drug users. I only had a sample size of 100 here. Um, let's see, my alternate was, I had a two-sided alternate, so let me go activate the not equals to. When I go down and I hit calculate, it looks like I'm getting a p-value of about 1.5% or 1.4%. So let me write that down. That's the important piece of information. So my p-value is zero. Oops, let me write the equal sign. Is 0 0.014. All right, now they gave me this alpha level of 5%. So in this case, I know my p-value is less than alpha because 1.5% is less than 5%. All right, and the rule is when your p-value is less than alpha, right, I know I'm gonna reject H naught. Now, I, I don't know what these answers are yet, I'm gonna figure them out, but I'm gonna go ahead and reject H naught. So I believe that the average postal service, uh, or average mean time for employee, excuse me, for employment, but the average postal service is not seven and a half years, right? I think it's, it's changed from that. Apparently it's gone down maybe by half a year. Okay, all right, so let's see. There is convincing evidence that the mean time working with the postal service has changed. Well, that's true, that's exactly what that says. I have evidence that the mean is no longer seven and a half years. So my answer is A. 
So in this case, my first sentence there was the correct answer, but let's, let's talk about why the other ones are not correct, right? This is there is not convincing evidence that the mean has changed. That's not true. Because I'm gonna reject H naught, we would say there is evidence for the alternate, right? There is convincing evidence that the mean working time with the postal service is now seven years. So no, it's, it's not that we're saying it's definitely seven years. All right, what we're saying is it's no longer seven and a half years. I don't know if it's seven years exactly. I just know it's no longer seven and a half years. I get that our sample mean was seven years, but it doesn't mean that the population mean is seven years. All we're saying right now is it's no longer seven and a half years. Maybe it's 7.1, maybe it's 6.9, maybe it's 6.5, we're not sure. All we know is it's no longer 7.5. All right, we cannot draw a conclusion at the 5% significance level. The sample size is too small. That's nonsense. Our sample size is plenty large. All right. Okay, so let's try 17. All right, so this one says you are testing, it looks like we're in mean land. I see the muse. Let me write mean land. All right, I know I'm going to run a t-test. All right, we've got our null, we've got our left-tailed alternate. I've got a sample of 20, and it looks like I only have the one sample. As I'm going through this, if I have a sample of 20, I also know I have 19 degrees of freedom. I'll just keep that in mind. Okay, so I've got mu is 10 against the left-tailed alternate, SRS of 20, the test statistic, or they gave me the test statistic, find the p-value. Okay, so this is one of those cases where I couldn't use my calculator in terms of the t-test. And let me show you what I mean by that. If I go to t-test here, right, and you say, well, I know that the, the mean is hypothesized to be 10, right? You might even say, well, I know I have a less than alternate, right? I know I have a sample size of 20, but you get stuck because I did not give you the sample mean and I did not give you the sample standard deviation. So I can't do anything here, right? I can't use t-test but we can use other things, okay? So let me head back to the page where we started looking at um, hypothesis tests for means. Give me one moment to find it. Here we go, okay? So here's the rule, all right? If I wanna get a p-value, I'm gonna look and determine which alternate did I have, and then I'm gonna find some areas under curves. So let's see, what alternate did we have? We had the left-tailed alternate, right? I had mu was less than 10. All right, when you have a left-tailed alternate, you need the area under the t-curve to the left of the calculated t-value. Okay, so let's see what that would wind up being for us. I'm gonna draw a picture first, just so I can gauge it that way. I always like to draw a picture just so I have like my gut feelings going on in terms of what this will look like. So I'm gonna draw the t-curve. Looks a lot like the z-curve. It's technically the t-curve with 19 degrees of freedom. All right, zero would be under the peak, and negative two would be over here somewhere. So I think negative 2.25 would be like here-ish. And I need to go to the left of that. So it's not much area, right? It should be pretty small, but then if I look at my boundaries, these are all pretty small, right? Is it between one and 2%, two and 5%? five and 25%, is it greater than 25%? Well, just looking at this, this is not greater than 25%. So I know D isn't my answer. Based on the way I graphed it, I'm, I'm thinking it might be between two and 5%, but I'm also not the best drawer. So I'm, I'm gonna test this out, okay? So if we go back to what this said, right? We need the area under the curve to the left of the calculated test statistic. So I'm gonna say here, that my p-value is the probability that t is less than negative 2.25. Right? I need to go to the left of my calculated test statistic. And we learned in this chapter that if I wanna pick up area under the curve, I'm not gonna use normal CDF because I'm not on the z-curve. I'm gonna use t-CDF. And we need three pieces of information. We need low, high, and degrees of freedom. Well, my low is gonna be negative infinity. My high is gonna be negative 2.25, and I had, there it was, 19 degrees of freedom. So let's see what my, my p-value is. I'm gonna get out of this since I can't use it. 
we're going to distributions, I'm going to go TCDF. All right, we had negative infinity, negative 2.25, and I had 19 degrees of freedom. So it looks like my p-value is about 0.018. Right? And if you like it better as um, percentages, you can write it as about 1.8%. So now I just got to figure out where this is wedged between. All right, is 0 0.018 between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02? Yeah, it is. All right, so this is my answer. So I, I was guessing B based on my graph. My graph was a little bit off, but I, I had a feeling it would be either A or B. I thought C would be a little too large, and D was definitely way too large. Okay. All right. Last multiple choice question, let's take a look. All right, let me get it in view, there we go. All right, so this is a 95% confidence interval for a population, all right, mean is calculated here. So I'm gonna just take note, I know I'm in mean land. I'm gonna use a t-test statistic. I know because I'm in chapter nine, I only got the one sample, okay. Assume that conditions for performing inference are met. So I got through normality, I, I got a random sample or a sample that represents my population, I know my sample standard deviation, I'm ready to go on that front. What conclusion can we draw for a test of this two-sided alternate at the 5% significance level based on a confidence interval? Okay, so we got a whole bunch of information there. They gave us this confidence interval, but they also set us up with a hypothesis test. Okay, so I've mentioned this before, that when you have a two-sided alternate, which we do, it is equivalent to a confidence interval as long as the alpha level and the confidence level add up to 100%. And they do in this case, because 5% plus 95% equals 100%. All right, we saw a version of this in proportion land when we were dealing with the fishermen um, who were suspicious that the lake owners, uh, the, the lake owners were claiming 80% of the fish met the minimum length requirement, and the, the fishermen were like, mm, I don't think so. We constructed a confidence interval for that, but that was in proportion land. So we're going to approach the same idea, but in mean land. All right, so what this confidence interval is saying is I think mu is between 1.7 and 5.3. All right, that's the confidence interval estimate, right? It says mu is somewhere in here. So based on that confidence interval, what do we think is true? Do we think the null is true? Do we think mu is two? Or do we have evidence, sufficient evidence that mu is different from two, right? If we look at the question, it says what conclusion can we draw for a test where we have mu being two against the two-sided alternate. All right, so let's look at this. Can we draw no conclusion? That's what this is saying. We can't draw a conclusion. We cannot draw a conclusion at the 5% level since this test is not connected to the 97.5% confidence interval. And again, it has nothing to do with it being 97.5 because this is 95% and this is 5% and those add up to 100. This is not our correct answer, okay? None. Confidence intervals and significance tests are unrelated procedures. That's also false. They're very connected. As I was saying, if you have a confidence interval and a two-sided alternate, right, two-sided, they're connected as long as the alpha level and the confidence level add up to 100%. So just as a counterexample, let's say this was a 2% alpha and this was a 98% confidence interval, they'd be connected, okay? If this was a 10% alpha and a 90% confidence interval, they'd be connected. But if this was a 5% alpha like it is, and this was a 90% confidence interval, those are not connected, all right? But this is not true. All right, are we gonna reject H naught or would we fail to reject H naught? So let's think about this. Do we think it's possible that mu is two, okay? Or do we think mu is different from two? Well, they told me mu is between 1.7 and 5.3, right? So if I was gonna look at the number line, we got 1.7 to 5.3. Well, what's right in between that? Two. So do I think mu is two? It's sure possible, right? According to my confidence interval, two is right inside that interval. So because two is inside this interval, we're gonna keep the null, right? Keep it. Or how we would say it in stats terms is we would fail to reject H naught. So in terms of what's correct here, D is gonna be my correct answer, all right? So because two is in our interval, 
I'm going to fail to reject H0. Now, just as a counterexample, even though this isn't the case here, let's say for some reason they had this. They had mu equaling 6 against not equaling 6. If this was the case, then I would actually reject H0 because 6 was not inside of our interval. Right? I did the confidence interval and said mu is between 1.7 and 5.3. That is different from 6. Now, we had 2s. So I'm going to put back in the fail to shenanigans. So we'll put 2, 2, and we got fail to. But it always comes down to, was your hypothesized mean in the interval? If it was, fail to reject the, the, the null. If your hypothesized mean is not in the interval, then you're going to reject the null. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of summary on terms of what we've learned, and we're going to wrap up chapter 9.